Hi, and welcome to Learn Rosin Now. Today we're going to take a look at the semantic model and how we can use it to interface with the symbol API. So far in this series, we've stuck largely to, you know, um, taking these strings and parsing them into syntax trees, which we can then use the syntax tree API to sort of navigate up and down these trees and, and look at different nodes along the way. But the downside of using this API is that every syntax tree only knows about itself and doesn't know anything about the program in a broader sense. So it doesn't know about any other syntax trees. Um, it can't tell you information about like whether or not system or console here are namespaces or types, because they could be either from the syntax tree's perspective. Um, it can't tell you what, where this right line method is defined, um, where the file where it's defined, or the syntax tree where it's defined, or even if it's defined at all. And it certainly can't tell you any information about um, overload resolution or anything advanced like that. So the symbol API is where we sort of start to get this rich information about our program as a whole. Um, it, it occurs after uh, you know, all syntax trees have been parsed, all the references have, have been located and included and, and you know, understood, and it allows us to you know, reason about our program in a broader sense. And the semantic model is the bridge between the syntax tree API and the world of the symbol API. And that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here today. So we've got a small program here, um, and not too much is different than what we've done in previous videos. We're essentially passing in this program here, uh, which gets parsed into a syntax tree, um, which we can then analyze. So where things start to get a little, a little different is we're creating a reference to MS Corelib. Um, and this is a core library that drives everything uh, in C Sharp. It's where system.console.writeline exists and a lot of those uh, core system libraries. And then we use this reference and this tree to create a compilation. Now, when I say compilation, I don't mean we've emitted this to disk yet. It just means we've got all the references, all the trees we've needed, and now we can reason about our program uh, at a higher level. So we'll go ahead and we'll get the semantic model from this compilation. Semantic model equals compilation dot get semantic model. And we just pass in the tree that we'd like to uh, analyze and, and get the model for. Um, and now what we'll do is we'll start running this and we'll get the symbol for this, this method here. And the way we'll do that is we have to bridge, use the semantic model as a bridge between the syntax tree API and the symbol API. So we first need the syntax for that. Method syntax is equal to root.descendant nodes of type. And we want the method declaration syntax. And in this program, I think there's only one, so we can do single. And I should name this method syntax. So this is, this is how we get our, our method syntax. And now we want to get the corresponding symbol. So the way we do that is var method symbol is equal to semantic model dot get declared symbol. And this allows us to pass in a piece of declaration syntax, such as method declaration syntax or class de declaration syntax, and get the symbol for that. So we'll go ahead and do that. And oops, method syntax. And this gives us uh, the, the complete symbol. And this symbol now knows about everything uh, related to you know itself, its parent type, um, the parent assembly. So we can start looking at things like var parent assembly is equal to method symbol dot containing assembly. I'm actually not sure what will come up here because. Yeah, so, so in our case, it's just got the name my compilation because that's what we provided and no version information because we haven't done anything interesting there. Um, so that's how we get the symbols for uh, pieces of declaration syntax such as method. We can also do it for classes. So let's do that for uh, our first class is equal to root.descendantNodes.ofType class declaration syntax and we'll get the first one here because we have two. Um, we've got a partial, um, we've got a partial class up here, and the same uh, partial class down here. And while these are totally unique objects in the syntax tree API's perspective, uh, the symbol API will actually show us that they should be the same. So we'll get the first method and the last method, and now we'll just get the symbols for each of them. First symbol is equal to, uh, and we'll do the same thing as before. Semantic model, semantic model dot get declared symbol and we pass in first class 
and then we do a second symbol is equal to, and we'll pass in the second class. And now we'll just confirm our r equal is equal to first symbol is equal to second symbol. Oops, second symbol. I'm not typing well today. And we see that they are indeed equal and, and that they're the same. So that's sort of something unique about the, the symbol API. Whereas in syntax land, these would have looked different. They have different, you know, children. Uh, everything about them is different except for their names. Um, you know, in the symbol, the symbol land, it knows that these represent the same concept behind the scenes and that both of these uh, classes are essentially uh, one. You could represent them as one big class with uh with methods and children and, and, and so on. So that's one way to interact with the, uh, the semantic model and the symbol API. Um, but there's actually one more way to sort of get across this bridge from syntax to symbols. And that's if you want to look at something like this invocation syntax. Uh, you might have noticed we're using semantic model dot get declared symbol and we had to pass in pieces of declaration syntax. So we were looking at class declarations and we were looking at um, method declaration. Um, that same method won't give you anything if you pass in this system.console.writeline. Um, you'll have to use another method called semanticmodel.getSymbolInfo. So we'll go ahead and just get rid of a lot of this stuff. And I'll keep this around. Actually, we'll just keep this around. And I'll show you how we use this other, this other API. So we can go var invoked method is equal to um, root dot descendant nodes and this time we're not looking for a piece of declaration syntax we're looking for a piece of invocation expression syntax so not a not a declaration just a usage of, of that method um, and it gives us our system dot console dot right line and now we have to go var symbol info is equal to semantic model dot get symbol Info. And you might notice there's a ton of methods on this semantic model. And we're really only scraping the surface, but I think this, these are the, the two most popular methods that you'll end up using the most. So invoked method. And this symbol info doesn't give you a symbol right away. It gives you uh, something of type symbol info, and it's got a few different things on it. It's got a candidate reason, um, candidate symbols, and symbol. So if your program compiles successfully 100%, um, then it will give you a single symbol uh, to work with. But say, for example, um, you had uh, a missing symbol or, you know, something was uh, not quite being, it wasn't possible for the compiler to figure out which overload of a method you were specifying. Well, in that case, it might actually give you a number of symbols back that uh, allow you you personally to decide what you want to do and which symbol you're actually interested in. But for the purposes of um, most of the work I do, operating on symbol seems to be uh, mostly enough. So we'll do invoke symbol is equal to symbol info dot symbol. But I know there are some people who make analyzers out there and they like to look at all of the candidate symbols so their analyzers can work even when uh, the program doesn't necessarily compile. Um, so in our case, we've got one invoked symbol. It comes back as system.console.writeline. Uh, we can do the same thing we did before of our containing assembly. We can look at the containing assembly of this invoked symbol. Containing symbol. And in this case, it should be, uh, oops, sorry, not containing symbol. That's the uh, parent. So that's the parent type system.console. But uh, we want... Uh, containing assembly, containing assembly, and that will give us hopefully MS Core Lib the version, um, just showing that that this is what we indeed loaded earlier. Um, so one more thing to notice is that we're using these uh, symbols. They're all I symbol. That's the base class for all symbol, all symbols. But you can actually uh, get more specific. So in this case, we can cast this to I method symbol, and you know. There's I property symbols and I named type symbols for classes and structs. And there's a whole host of different kinds of symbols that you can use. And they give you a little bit more uh, specific information about um, and some extra, you know, methods to, to look at here uh, 
in on the symbol API. So you can find like uh, is partial, I think, uh, partial definition part. So, you know, a methods in C sharp can be partial. So, you know, the same way classes can be partial. Methods can also be partial in C sharp. And now that we know we're dealing with a method, method symbol, um, we have an API to interact with these partial methods if, if we'd like to. Um, so the final thing I guess I'll say on the symbol API is that it's extremely broad. You might have been noticing from the IntelliSense that I was getting at that there was, uh, you know, probably almost a hundred properties and methods on some of these objects, the semantic model, the symbol, mo the symbol API. Um, and the best way as usual to, to figure these sorts of things out is either through IntelliSense or using source.roslyn.io to view these things and, and read through the documentation that exists uh, within the source code itself. Um, actually, one final note I'll say about the semantic model is that um, if you keep these semantic models around, there is a cost in terms of memory. Uh, you know, there's some overhead uh, with, with all the information that they hold on to and, and pre prevent from getting garbage collected. But there's also uh, a significant performance uh, a significant performance increase that you'll get out of that. So these semantic models, as you ask them questions about declared symbols and, and getting symbol info, um, will cache this information. It will be uh, subsequently faster on, um, you know, for other calls that you make to the API. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. If you ever have to do like a thousand calls to the semantic model and then you want to get rid of it, it's good to keep it around instead of just going uh, compilation.get semantic model over and over again. Um, that's that's been my experience, and that's what I've uh, read in the, the documentation itself or the source code itself. So I think that that'll conclude this episode. Uh, thanks for watching, and if you have any recommendations for other topics in Roslyn uh, you'd like to hear about, just leave them in the comments below, and and hopefully we'll we'll get to them over the the next coming weeks. Thanks a lot.